Hello everyone, so these past few days I've been working on this piece. As you can see the modeling is really simple, there are no complex uh, shapes in the scene. Uh, but what took most of the time was actually texturing as well as tweaking and adding a little bit of details. Uh, I asked for a lot of feedback online. Uh, so this is the first point I want to talk about actually. So a lot of people when they think about Blender they just think of the software but I think it's a, it's a bundle. So there is a software and there is the community as well. I think you should really make use of this. Uh, whenever you have questions, you you should really post post them online and ask for feedback when you do your renders. People will usually uh, give you very good ideas and some nice feedback that might help you in your journey to learn. There is of course Reddit, right? There is uh, Stack Exchange. And there's also the Blender Artists Forum. There's probably a list goes on, you can search for other forums maybe. But these are one of the main ones. So yes, don't forget to make use of this community part of, of Blender. It's really important. This video is going to be some sort of a breakdown of this shot. I will try to explain my thought process behind some of the choices I made. The first aspect is composition. As you can see here, uh, I will enable my overlays. I, I enabled the, what are they called? Uh, camera composition guides, I think. So as you can see here, I applied the, I sort of applied the rule of thirds. Instead of placing my bottle in the center of the scene, uh, it was placed a little bit uh, to the bottom left corner. So the idea here is that it, first of all, it makes the bottle closer to the viewer, but it also, it also allows me to uh, utilize my next point, which is going to be uh, depth of field. Yeah, I, I think I took this opportunity to abuse uh, the depth of field, because in this scene there's only two elements, there's the box and the pill bottle. So the fact that the box is quite close to the bottle, and the bottle being the center of focus, made it so that we can see most of the details in the bottle. Since the bottle are also quite similar to each other, it's they're exactly the same actually, with just uh, some rotation, some randomized rotation. It doesn't matter if I if I put this whole area out of focus. I think it makes uh, the shot a little more cinematic, but it, we don't lose any detail in the scene overall. You get what I mean. The third aspect is lighting. First of all, if you're looking for realism, obviously, uh, nothing beats an HDRI. It's just way superior, it gives, it adds a lot of mood to your scene. So I really advise you to use an HDRI. Uh, sometimes you might need to use uh, area lights or spotlights or external lights, but most of the time uh, it's HDRIs. There is Polyhaven which has a lot of uh, a lot of HDRs that you can you can download multiple ones and then try them, uh, see which one fits your scene. I think I had to try like eight, seven, yeah, seven or eight HDRs until I find I found one I'm I'm satisfied with, and the rest is is actually adding planes to block some light. In my case, I added one big plane uh, on this side and then two planes here up top. I will show you just to block some light from this side and then let all the light come from this way that's it but there is there is zero ex there is zero uh, artificial light aside from that you can obviously also play with the power of your hdri uh, it doesn't have to be one so make sure uh, yeah in this scene i think i i upped the power to 1.6 so yeah make j you can just play with these parameters it's i think it's already enough to make uh, good uh, lighting in a scene. Here is my lighting setup, the backdrop obviously. Uh, these two planes are not doing much to be honest, it just I forgot them here because I was experimenting in the beginning. But this big plane here is the main culprit, it's the one blocking the light from the, the other side as I explained. So while we're talking about lighting, let's mention light linking. Um, light linking is a feature that's going to be uh, introduced in Blender 4.0 I think, starting, starting from Blender 4.0. Um, the render engine I'm using right now is, is Octane. 
So light linking uh, is already supported in Octane. Um, if you don't know what light linking is, it's simply uh, the fact that you can assign an ID to uh, a light object. And uh, so for instance, this light can only affect one object and not another. So you can have a light that will affect this object and this object only and it will not affect this one. But yeah, that's the main gist of it. Um, when you're doing, when you're going for realism, uh, do not use light linking. Okay, just don't. Do not use it. Do not use light linking because uh, you might introduce uh, some light in scenarios that are not possible in real life. You might not be able to see it, but the human brain can actually uh, recognize when. I don't know, some part of the scene is lit evenly. So let's say I add a light just to add, uh, just to make this uh, label brighter. The brain might be able to see that the amount of light hitting the plastic part as w and the label is not the same. I think they call this a light ratio. Yeah, so if, if you mess up the light ratio between different parts of your scene, it will look off. Uh, light linking is useful when you're doing product shots, and in most product shots, they use a lot of uh, a lot of flags to block light. And sorry, they use a lot of flags to block light, and a lot of um, what do they call them? Add-ons they could add to uh, cameras to focus the light. I think there is one called the snoot. Uh, this is how it's written, maybe I think. Uh, so it's already artificial, right? And I think light linking is very useful in that case if you wanna light a certain label that has maybe uh, the, the the writing on it is is in a metallic, and you want to light it a little more to have some uh, ref nice reflections. Maybe that would be nice, but if you're going for realism, you should not use light linking. You should always try to recreate. Uh, if you're copying, for instance, a, a, a photograph, you you have to try to recreate it with uh, how it was lit naturally. So either with an HDRI or using lights, just normal lights, but yeah, no light linking. Again, no light linking. The fourth aspect is imperfections. You've probably heard of this multiple times, but you need to add imperfections to your models to make them look more realistic. As you can see in the bottle, uh, it's highlighted by the light. You, you can see there are fingerprints on the cap uh, as well as on the plastic bottle. There's also some scratches here. As you can see in this bottom side it's also in the top but it's, it's very subtle um, so if we separate these imperfection maps into uh, two parts so maybe we can say scratches and then fingerprints the difference here is that scratches are are usually affecting if you look at them in real life they're usually affecting the surface of your material so let's say this is the surface of your material once it gets scratched it becomes like this Right, so this yeah, this is a side view of your of the surface of your material, which makes sense. So scratches should should not go into the roughness channel. They should go into uh, either normal bump uh, height. Yeah, it's all the same, or displacement. Um, these are these are somewhat simulating the displacement of your mesh, whereas displacement is actually uh, displacing your geometry. So. This is, for instance, a vertex, this is a vertex, and this is another vertex. Just an example. Whereas these are just uh, simulating the displacement by um, moving, I think, the normals of your of your uh, surface, uh, depending on where the camera is looking at it, I think. So that's the main difference. Uh, fingerprints, on the other hand, uh, this is the surface of your material and then when there is a fingerprint it becomes something like let me change the color like this so there is some sort of I don't know oily surface on top of your surface so you have these changes in in roughness so here it's low roughness whereas here it's high roughness or the opposite doesn't matter so that's what's causing these uh, differences that's why fingerprints should go into the roughness channel uh, and here I will show you where, where you can get uh, imperfection maps for free. Um, it's obviously Quixel. You probably have heard of it. So you go to the Quixel Mega Scans website 
and then you can create an account it's fairly straightforward and then you look for imperfections here you have uh, different imperfections grain rubber stain stone leakage fingerprints for instance and yeah you it's more than enough what you have here you can just download three or four maps and then use them throughout your projects it's very hard to distinguish uh, repeating patterns in fingerprints so three are more than enough and they're usually very high quality so I really advise you to make use of this uh, library another aspect is details uh, where do you get details you get details from uh, reference photos yeah I think you've heard it multiple times from multiple people you always need to use reference images when modeling stuff and when uh, adding details to your mesh to your models um, it's simple stuff for instance uh, I made sure to add uh, some slits here akin to what you have in uh, cardboard in in boxes yeah in medicine boxes or packages um, I someone on reddit gave me the idea to add some braille which is really nice uh, there's obviously uh, some bump maps in my labels so as you can see uh, politics is embossed uh, here as well it's uh, it's embossed out in this spot um, all of this the barcodes this and this as well as this I found on Google images so you really don't have to look far find um, some details to add into your labels or your objects in general I also added some uh, leakage as you can see here some leakage to this label to make it a little more grungy the last part would probably be uh, post-processing um, so I do mine uh, on Photoshop but you can use other software like um, DaVinci Resolve I guess a lot of people use that so the most important part is when you're doing uh, a still image it's always better to export your image in EXR instead of PNG All right so this gives you a lot of dynamic range so you can tweak you can play with your uh, different post processing effects uh, to a much higher degree when you're using EXR so always always use EXRs when you're doing stills uh, the, the, yeah the only downside is that they are usually they take a lot more space but I think there are a lot of uh, compression algorithms that solve that issue uh, there's a channel called Polyfjord he he did a, a video about talking about EXR so yeah I uh, I recommend you to check that out maybe you'll you'll probably learn a lot in Photoshop I usually use uh, camera raw uh, despite what a lot of people say uh, you usually play with the sliders until you can see on the screen something that looks good uh, don't be afraid to adjust stuff that's it that's all I can say um, for grain uh, you can use the oh yeah by the way you, you have to add blur a little bit of, of blur to your uh, final image just to avoid that uh, CG look they call it uh, yeah but very subtle like if you're using uh, sorry if you're using a Gaussian blur in, in Photoshop um, I usually put a value of 0.2 or point, point 0.3 at max it's it's yeah it's enough and um, you can also use Photoshop's noise but uh, sometimes it's not the best so um, you can use noise overlays or grain uh, from other sources I will put a link in the description to uh, to a Behance page where you can download a 8k resolution uh, grain overlays they also add um, so camera imperfections uh, I think that's a good idea so you can you can play with that as well uh, what I shared here is mostly coming from my limited experience um, so I might be wrong but I, I just thought about sharing sharing it so maybe it could give you uh, ideas or new perspectives or maybe help you in your renders Keep trying and um, have a great day.